I also feel good because we have a wonderful keynote speaker this morning, actually one of my public health heroes. First learned about him um, when someone pointed to me to the January 24th, 2011 article by Atwell Gawande called The Hot Spotters, which thrust um, Dr. Jeffrey Brenner and his work into the national spotlight. As an epidemiologist, I love the way that he analyzed data of, of healthcare utilization from the hospitals and all that he had to do to analyze it and to understand the data, but most importantly, how he then used it to improve the health and the health care and the delivery and the system in Camden, New Jersey. And that became a model for the country. Um, he received the MacArthur Foundation Genius Award for his uh, efforts. And I want to point, and um, he, ha his agency in, in Camden, he has led that for many years. He continues to serve as executive director while they are searching for a replacement because um, his bio is in, is in our program. He recently joined as a senior vice president of United Healthcare. And I want to point out the, um, a, a, um, an odd confluence, a, a happy confluence of events, uh, just so there's no misunderstanding. We're very grateful that United Healthcare is our sponsor. Um, they agreed to do that a long time ago. Um, Dr. Brenner agreed to be our uh, keynote speaker before he moved to United Healthcare. So I just want to make sure everyone understands our uh, keynote speakership is not for sale. Um, it's for, just, for the, just for the virtue of the work of, of, of what he has done. So I really just ask uh, Dr. Brenner to come up and I ask all of you to listen. We will learn and be blessed. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much for the invitation. I, I feel deeply honored to have a chance to speak in front of you. This is a room of giants. You guys um, started a long time ago working with the most vulnerable citizens in our country and uh, have pioneered lots of new ideas and how to take care of them. When I think about population health, um, it's not gizmos and gadgets and algorithms, it's you all. You defined a population and did whatever it took to uh, reach them and, and, and help them uh, live better lives. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm also here with a very clear message, which is that you've arrived. So you started on the fringes of healthcare, and you're uh, about to become a mainstream part of the healthcare system. Um, and, and I want to use uh, this pool as a metaphor for that. Uh, to point out that your field and your movement uh, have arrived in a way that you can't even imagine. And frankly, I started my career in Camden, New Jersey in, in obscurity uh, and was very content to work there. Uh, and slowly our work in Camden got discovered and outed as well. So, uh, so this pool is um, in the middle of a complex and a revolution's happening here. And uh, uh, this is in Phoenix, Arizona. And this was a, a building that was falling apart. And United Healthcare took its cash reserves. And the way insurance companies work, by statute, they're required in every state, if they do business and have a license, to put lots of money, cash reserves, in the bank. And that money is often invested in treasury bills or in bonds where there's a very low rate of return. So United took $22 million and loaned them to a community-based organization. CPLC to buy and renovate a 400 unit apartment building and then 100 units are set aside for United patients. And it's highly subsidized because they didn't expect a high rate of return, or I should change my pronoun because we didn't expect a high rate of return. <laughs> uh, it meant that the apartments are only $300 a month and that we're actually subsidizing some down to, not to zero. So that means no Section 8, right? It's a pretty big deal. You know, people on SSI could eventually afford these apartments. In my work in Camden, we ended up building out a Housing First model where Section 8 vouchers are amazing and horrible, right? I mean, it was taking us nine months to qualify people between the inspections of the apartment and the uh, qualifying the tenants. A uh, ridiculous process to get through. Uh, so what happens when the sixth largest corporation in America one of the largest insurers that has six million patients in 26 states discovers your field and realizes that not only is there a moral and ethical imperative to provide better care to complex patients, but there's a business imperative as well. 
That's a, that's a wonderful moment for you all. It means that you've succeeded. Success doesn't necessarily come the way you imagine it's going to come. Uh, it can come when uh, very large insurers, two of which that are sponsoring you, have decided that there's a business imperative to understand what you do and buy what you do. And the question is, are you ready to sell it efficiently and effectively at scale? You know, if we're going to cure homelessness, this has to go from being a revolution to being a, a you know, a, a, a scaled business model, a delivery model that can deliver care at scale. So I want to focus my comments on some of those pieces today. So let me help you understand the business case for why United's interested in this. So this is real data from uh, Phoenix, Arizona, looking at uh, average ERUs and hospital admits for our average members in Phoenix and our uh, homeless members. As you know, there's an ICD-10 code for homelessness. It's beginning to be used by hospitals, so we can start to cut our data and, and understand at a national level, at a state level, at a regional level, what the, uh, the social impact and the financial impact of homelessness are. When you really start to move a movement is when you're able to make not only the social and moral case for it, but the business case for it as well. So uh, folks with uh, ICD-10 codes of homelessness are using the ER nine times more. Uh, they're being admitted six times more than the average, and they're spending three times more than the average. More detailed financial data, uh, comparing folks that are homeless and not homeless, we're paying uh, 3,800 on average, uh, and 12,000 on average for homeless patients. So very significant impact to the company. And uh, a very strong recognition that you can't keep doing business as usual, that if you're delivering Medicaid in a public environment with constrained public funds, you have to think every day about how you deliver better care at lower cost. So I'll give you two cases of patients that we've recently moved in and uh, want to call out uh, the medical respite program in Phoenix. Sister Adele is here, I think, in Circle City. Have been uh, great partners as well. Sister Adele. Uh, so this is a 50-year-old uh, Medicaid member who gave us permission to tell a story, um, who had uh, lots of medical issues, 165 ER visits, 50 hospital admits, um, and $385,000 in cost. And I, I wouldn't be here if I thought we spent the money well, if we transformed his life and changed his life by spending that much money. I could buy a lot of medical respite, right? I could buy a lot of counseling, I could buy a lot of wraparound services, it's just uh, not a great way for our society to be spending its resources. And it's also a way of sending a very clear message to folks all across the political spectrum, to business leaders, about why investing in better care for uh, uh, homeless people is a good investment for society. And not only does it change lives, but it's a, it's a thoughtful investment as well. Another example of a case in Phoenix uh, is a patient with uh, malignant neoplasm, he's got essentially cancer of the throat, um, he has uh, an open tracheostomy, and as many of you know, shelters aren't really equipped to take care of medically complex patients. That's why uh, medical respite has evolved. So this patient had 29 ER visits, 7 admits, and $237,000 in cost, and uh, is now living next to a pool in, in a, an apartment building in Phoenix, paid for by this insurance company. In So um, I want you all to know that you can get the claims data for your patients. And the way that you can do this is if your patient signs a medical release form, their medical billing data is part of their medical record. So they can sign a consent form, and then your hardworking interns, which lots of you guys have interns, like that's how we built the Camden Coalition with interns. And uh, you can send them to all the local hospitals, go to the medical records department, and ask for a copy of all the medical bills which lets you start to put a, a picture together of the value that you're delivering in the system, of how complex and expensive your patients have been. So the business unit that I'm running inside of United is part of the Medicaid business line, and it's trying to figure out how do you blend together the medical dollars, the behavioral home, the addiction, the social service dollars, to both um, uh, procure and then ensure the right service for the right person every day. That's a pretty challenging piece, because we not only have uh, homeless members, but you have a whole whole tapestry, a heterogeneity of very complex people in Medicaid, all of which are driving costs in various uh, ways, and all of which need 
the same kind of wraparound models that you build for homelessness, these other populations end up needing very similar things. So why is this imperative? As all of you know, um, we're uh, spending more than any other country in healthcare. We spend almost twice as much as every other country. So the green line is percent of GDP. It's actually up to almost 18% now. Um, so, you know, that's almost twice other countries. Are you all feeling twice the love? <laughs> Do you feel twice the caring? <laughs> twice the access? Twice the quality? I mean, what other economic model anywhere in the world, in our country, you know, we're supposed to be capitalist, right? You know, what, why the hell would anyone pay twice as much for half the quality? It's an amazing idea. I mean, that, that's a, it's an obscene system in our country where costs just keep going up and quality doesn't seem to go up either. So uh, at some point that system runs out of air and things start to change. The scary line is the blue line, and that's percent of GDP, uh, percent of personal income going into healthcare. Now, next time you get your, your paycheck, I want you to look closely at it, because there's an employee contribution for healthcare. It's maybe $200 every two weeks, maybe $250. Then you've got co-pays and deductibles as well. And then hidden behind all that is an employer contribution that often matches the employee contribution. And if you haven't gotten a raise and your organization is struggling to give you a raise, part of that is because the employer contribution for your health benefits just keeps going up and up and up and up. So it's to the point now that if you add up the, all of that, we're spending 20% of our personal income in America on health care between the employer and the employee contribution. We think that income inequality is partly being generated by the increase in cost in health care that the reason the middle class have not gotten a pay increase is because much of what should be going into their salary is going into your wages, which is really about your health benefits. So we've got a big problem, and I believe that you're part of the solution. You know, once again, not only is this the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do, but there's an incredible business imperative. If you look at Medicare, the largest contributor to the long-term federal debt is Medicare, health care. And if you look at state budgets, the biggest growing part of state budgets is Medicaid. And we're crowding out all of the other things we care about. So in America, we've actually had bridges fall down, right? Because we're not repairing it. We're incredibly behind our infrastructure. We're crowding out public education. So our public colleges, if uh, kids are having to pay more and more of the tuition out of pocket because we're crowding them out. So you're a key part of the strategic imperative to deliver better care at lower cost and lower state spending in Medicaid. So how are we going to do that? How many of you have seen or read the book, The American Healthcare Paradox? Uh, this is the business case for all of what you do. It's an incredibly powerful and important book and an incredible hypothesis to the book. So if you look at this, these are um, developed modern countries with modern healthcare systems. The dark bar is their healthcare spending, and the light bar is their social service spending. And this is looking at the ratio of the two. So uh, back then, this is data from a couple years ago, we were spending 16%. As you can see, it's twice the average of the other countries. And we were spending 11% on social services. So we're the opposite ratio of all these countries. We're spending twice as much on healthcare and half as much on social services. The impact of this is that we're medicalizing social problems every day. You know, the most expensive homeless shelter in the country is a hospital. It was my hospital at Cooper. They built like a brand new wing on the hospital with fancy private rooms, flat screen TVs, that great button you could get room service. And then right outside the window, you could see Tent City across the way. You know, and I got a chance to speak to the board one day, and you know, I'm like, you guys have built the most expensive homeless shelter in the country. It's incredible. You know, the, the patients in Tent City just love this place. They can't believe how nice the rooms are. You have become the provider of choice for all of us in the region. <laughs> and you can see the board members just, their faces contorting. <laughs> a chest pain and they got two nets in the end here and they love the pillows they are so fluffy <laughs> that's how you make the business case for your services surely thereafter asked for a contribution for us <laughs> Thank you.
So let's go a little bit deeper in the data. So this is comparing U.S. data to um, developed countries around the world. At life expectancy, as you know, we have a lower life expectancy, we have a higher obesity rate, much higher infant mortality rate, a much, much, much higher drug-related death rate, and our incarceration rate, 698 prisoners per 100,000 population. You may or may not know, we incarcerate more people than any other country in the world, like more than Russia, China, Kazakhstan, the Congo, all these other countries. It's amazing, right? So not only are we medicalizing social problems, but we're also criminalizing and incarcerating social problems. And you guys sort of stand at that intersection. You're standing at the intersection between the two most expensive failing systems in our country. Our prison, you know, sort of prison industrial complex and our healthcare industrial complex. So you guys have the opportunity to add incredible value to the system. Um, as you begin to think about not only the social and ethical imperative, but the business imperative and political imperative for what you do. So this is how we respond to all this. Um, this is a, uh, a slide of all social programs <laughs> and how they all sort of interconnect and relate to one another, like a trillion dollars in social spending. So the, the question is, you know, not only are we spending our medical money, medical spend though, are we spending our, our incarceration, public defender, prosecutor, police department spend well? You know, the biggest expense for cities is the police department and the fire department. And what do they spend their days doing? Running around chasing your customers, right? Getting involved about it. They're not very happy doing that, right? And then this is how we're spending our social service dollars. You know, it's a crazy tapestry of services and very confusing tapestry of services. So what's Netflix going to look like in our, our, our world? So Netflix came along and disrupted Blockbuster Video. And, you know, let's think back. Um, the Friday night you went and you couldn't decide what video to rent, so you rented like a whole bunch of videos. You walked out a little stack of them. And then you got home and you like forgot you rented videos and you can't find them and you forgot to return them and they got you on a late fee, right? You know, and Netflix came along and Blockbuster Video was watching Netflix. You know, there hadn't been a moment at the senior level where folks were like, hey, they're starting to rent, you know, like they order videos and wait and they come in the mail. And the executive said, no, oh, we're doing great. Uh, we own real estate all over the country. We're, uh, you know, flying high. Our stock is flying high. So the, one of the good things about America is that we do disrupt and we let things go out of business. We let Blockbuster, we don't always let things go out of business. We should let Goldman Sachs go out of business, but... Rescue Blockbuster Video and let Goldman Sachs go out of business. But priorities, it's all about priorities. <laughs> so, you know, I kind of think you guys are, are Netflix, right? You know, uh, housing first. Sometimes technology isn't actually gizmos and gadgets, right? The most amazing technology was the wheel or democracy, right? Housing first is the most amazing technology of our generation. You cured homelessness. Like something that was unimaginable, that you could never accomplish. You guys are beginning to figure it out in a rigorous, data-driven way. And the data supports what you're doing. It's not only ethical, but it's the right business thing to do. That's Netflix. That's incredibly disruptive. Because if you pull all those, systems, all those patients out of the jail, out of the prison industrial complex, out of the healthcare system, we're going to collapse. We got like bonds to pay off in the healthcare side, right? We got rooms to fill. You know, your homeless patients help to fill the occupancy rates we need. You know, the way that healthcare system works and the hospital industry works, it's a lot like the airline industry. We have very high fixed costs. We got to keep the lights on. We got to, the, the statistic all the hospitals track is occupancy rates, right? Like we need those beds filled. We need those scanners filled. We need those appointment schedules filled. What if all your patients disappeared? What if all the mentally ill got healthy and stopped going to the hospital? What if all of the patients stopped being incarcerated and prisons were empty? Like, our society wouldn't know what to do with itself, right? It would collapse entire parts of the economy that expect your customers to fill their systems. So you guys are Netflix. <laughs> all right. So I want to talk about why this work is so hard and, uh, and the gaps in our understanding in the work. So this is a, a real CAT scan of a real human being. It's a middle class woman with a master's degree. 
and she has an abnormal CAT scan there, and she went to a five-hospital integrated delivery system, all connected by electronic health records. So this is supposed to be nirvana, right? You hear all about like integration and you know EHR and all, like, health IT is going to fix everything, right? You go to the like Kings conference, and it's like they've got it all figured out if you just hook one of your homeless patients to one of their super duper gizmos and send them through the algorithm and health IT is going to fix it all. So here's health IT at its best, right? Integrated five hospital system. This patient had 102 emergency room visits, 54 admissions, 147 CAT scans and 73 CAT scans of the head. Now this is not someone who's got, you know, homelessness and not homelessness. This is middle class woman with a master's degree. This could be you all or your friends or your family. I mean, this is a, a deep problem in the healthcare system about how it's constructed. So I'll bet if you went to your local hospital, you pulled their data set, which they'll never give you, you looked at the number of you know, people who had chest x-rays last year, complete blood counts, any variable, and you plot them out in the nomogram, all of the outliers got bad care. You know, there's someone in your local hospital who got like 50 chest x-rays last year, they didn't need just 50 chest x-rays, or 100 complete blood counts. All of the outliers in data, in these systems, tend to be folks that are getting bad services. So a group of family medicine residents found her, got to know her, and it turned out that she had severe anxiety and had lots and lots of early life trauma. Um, she began to get counseling, work through that, and her utilization stopped, stopped occurring. The other point I'd want to make on this is that, you know, these are basic intrinsic properties of how we've constructed healthcare, and uh, in that it's an incredibly heterogeneous problem. There are many, many, many reasons you can end up as an ER or a hospital or utilizer or over-utilizers of all these different public systems. So, uh, show of hands, who knows what the ACE study is? So you all win an award because this is the room with the most hands up, and I'm not surprised, right? You know, there really is an explanation for part of why your clinical models are so cutting edge. I've been in huge conferences with like 5,000 people in the room, and it's like a population health conference. And, you know, one person after another is proclaiming, you know, success in their population health models, and, but they're all struggling to actually save money, and their ACOs are kind of, kind of uh, pulling out of the, the CMS ACO model. And I'll, I'll ask for a show of hands, who's here for the ACE study? And no one in the room, except one lone social worker, way back to the back of the room, this is <laughs> So just for the folks that don't know, this is a fascinating literature. And this was put together um, by a guy named Felitti and a team at Kaiser Permanente, uh, who were a, a medical team. So these were, this came out of the out of, uh, healthcare side. And they put together a survey with 10 questions of all the horrible stuff that happens to kids. And you can add up a score, so you can actually get an ACE score. And uh, they then uh, sent it out to 17,000 middle class patients, and 70% of them returned the survey. Which is kind of an incredible rate of return for a survey asking you about horrible things that happened to you as a kid. And they agreed to have it connected to, to their um, medical records at Kaiser. And this has been repeated over and over and over and over. It's the best predictor we found for healthcare spending, healthcare utilization, for out of wedlock teen birth, for poorly controlled chronic illness, obesity, substance abuse. So all of these different things that we're struggling with on the healthcare side have an explanation for them that's tied back to things that happen to folks when they're kids. So toxic stress for children changes the way their brain is wired and how their physiology works. It changes their adaptive response to stress. You die 25 years before the rest of the population. Now we've heard that folks with mental illness die 25 years before the rest of the population. We know that your patients die 25 years before the rest of the population. We know that people with ACE scores of six and above die 25 years before the rest of the population. Those aren't three different groups of people, right? Like tremendous overlaps in those different groups. You know, the ACE score is probably a very strong predictor for ending up homeless, for ending up incarcerated as well. So all the, the common denominator for all of our public systems and for all of the people cycling and getting lost in our public systems is toxic stress in childhood. And for how our communities and our systems are set up and arrayed to be able to take care of them. Um, Trauma-informed care is only beginning to show us the road to, um, to how to uh, better care for them. So the problem we're trying to solve in my business unit in United, and I would argue the problem that population health and all of these different efforts around the country are trying to solve, 
is this slide, and it's a really hard problem to solve. Patients in the middle, the real person, and all the different services touching this patient. Uh, the primary care provider had to coordinate ophthalmology, pain management, GI, cardiology. The patient went from hospital number one to subacute rehab to hospital number two. Dialysis, nephrology, transplant, all the different social services. This patient didn't happen to be homeless, right? You could add that in as well, how much more difficult that would have been. The poor primary care provider was probably being paid $25, $30 for a 15-minute visit. One of the problems we have in Medicaid and in Medicare and in private insurance, we're actually paying too much for your care and not enough money for the care of folks that are really sick. So if you look at the fees and the prices and the way we make payments, we're actually we're not paying enough for sick folks and we're actually delivering too much care to healthy people. So it's one of the broader problems in the system. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about a Pareto curve. So uh, this is uh, emergency room use in Camden, New Jersey. And this is all emergency room use in one year. And there are 26,000 people on the left there who had one visit to the emergency room in a year. Two to three people, uh, 14,000 people had two to three visits. 3,000 people had four to five visits. Way over on the right-hand side, 330 people had 10 or more visits. Those are where your customers cluster out there. So that's a system failure, and rarely do we get, we lay data out in this way and think about segmentation, and think about who are the various customers, and are we meeting their needs, and how could we better meet their needs? We often, in the healthcare side, will put an incredibly good social worker in the emergency room to do ER diversion work. And statistically, who are they going to end up talking to? Just the, most of the people in the ER are only going to be there once in the year. They're going to end up talking to the 26,000 people who aren't going to be back, or the 14,000 people who are only there two to three times. You have to have very intentional systems to be able to target and find the folks that are way out on the right-hand side. Those are the folks that you're, you're interacting with. This basic credo curve is true for every public system. So if you look at your kid's classroom, there'll be one or two kids with a different learning style, and the teacher just can't pivot to that learning style. And they're getting yelled at, they're disrupting the classroom. Within a school, there'll be a couple of kids and families that are in the principal's office all the time. And that large hierarchical public system is having a hard time pivoting to the day-to-day -day needs of its outliers. In the medical system, we're having the same problem. The average diabetic on an average day gets average care, but if you're polymorbid, you're beginning to cross these different systems, we begin to fall apart. We can't handle the complexity. That's why you guys are kind of a unique model, because you're incredibly good at handling this one specific segment of very complex people. And really are the template for how we should be managing other complex populations. So there's three kinds of prevention in this kind of work. So there's primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention. Primary prevention is keeping healthy people healthy. Those are seatbelt smoke detectors. Secondary prevention is folks with mild chronic illness. So those are things like diabetic education programs, um, community-based diabetic programs. Uh, tertiary prevention are people who have had bad events happen. They've had heart attack strokes. They're beginning to fall apart. Most of what you do is tertiary prevention. Uh, Primary prevention has an ROI about 20 years out. Secondary prevention, five to 10 years out. The return on investment of investing in you all in tertiary prevention is immediate, because you've got patients that are lying in the hospital yesterday and the day before and the day before. So healthcare hotspotting are ideas pulled out of Bratton's work in policing about using data every day, day by day by day. Um, it's a strategic use of data to deliver targeted evidence-based services to complex patients with high utilization. And our hypothesis is that these patients are experiencing mismatch between what they need. They're waving their hands saying, I need something, and then those services are not available and constructed in the way that they need them. So um, it's actually very hard to get data moving around in real time so that you can track folks and target the right services to the right person in healthcare. That's extremely hard to do. So um, this is a, a terrifying picture. This is my COO's office at the Camden Coalition. And what you see there are brand new pillows and comforters and cups and bowls and plates and napkins. And I'm a doctor. That should be filled with like pill bottles or stethoscopes <laughs> or blood pressure cuffs, not pillows and plates and cups and napkins. So uh, Camden Coalition was around for 15 years, and we're doing all of this work. We built a health information exchange. 
We're targeting the most complex patients. We understand the data. We have um, contracts and relationships with all local hospitals. We go right into the hospital the day you're admitted and then follow you out, pull you through the system. We track you through the system, go with you to your appointments, integrate various services. And it wasn't working for the most costly patients because they're homeless. And sending them to a homeless shelter hurts them, makes them more anxious, so they go back to the hospital. And we were actually driving utilization up. It turns out that if you take complex patients and pay more attention to them, they'll actually go to the healthcare system more, but they won't get well. They'll just use more and more services. So um, as we, I began to understand more deeply the evidence base for housing first, realized that no one locally knew how to deliver it, that we would have to get into reshaping the system. Everyone said they did it when I went to visit them. And I'm like, no, I don't actually think what you're describing is housing first. So it took a long time, I'm a doctor, for God's sakes. It took a long time to realize that. You know, they, they would tell us that, you know, we've got all this figured out, just refer the patient to us. And then the patient kept getting fired and yelled at. <laughs> so we knew something wasn't working. So um, got much more deeply involved in this, got 50 Section 8 vouchers, um, put together the wraparound model, began to get people to the units. And I'm like, housing first. It's been nine months. That's all. housing first. <laughs> I don't care how much you have to spend. Like the guy just got out of the hospital. Like just put him in the apartment. And they're like, you can't do that. Then he won't be homeless. Like, I'm like, isn't that the purpose of our project? We have this money. We have these vouchers. I had no idea what a crazy system. I thought healthcare was messed up. So we get pretty deep into this, and uh, uh, and it's the best data that we've ever seen in our work. So we finally began to succeed in a way that I've never seen before in the data. So it's a hard slide to look at. Let me explain the slide to you. The green line is the day you moved in, and the, the timeline here is along the, the bottom here, the x-axis. Over on the left, it's up to 700 days before you got moved in, and on the right, is, um, is the days uh, after you got moved into the housing first unit. Each line here is a human being, and the little ticks, the little red ticks, are a day in the hospital or a day in the emergency room. The wider ones are a longer length of stay, days in the system. And it's essentially a day density map of how many days you spent in the hospital. So this is uh, about 40, 39 patients who um, we, we grabbed them right in the hospital and pulled them through the system. Um, and here you see a lot of density, a lot of ticks on the right. That's a lot of days in the hospital. That's really expensive. These are 50, 100,000, 150,000. What you see on the right is tremendous reduction in all the ticks, where the, the days in the hospital are melting away, right? What you see, though, is that there are three folks where the utilization didn't go down at all. They're non-responders. They're like the cancer that didn't respond to the biological treatment because we had the wrong treatment for the wrong person, right? This is personalized medicine, the way it should be done, right? So, but you see a lot of them responded profoundly to it. We have a ton to learn. So one of the problems in healthcare data is that if you take 100 really expensive, complex people and you do nothing with them, um, their utilization the following year drops by about 30%. It's called regression to the mean. It's a phenomenon of any outlier system that you look at extremis and you do nothing to it. It will tend to regress and go back to whatever the average or the mean is in that system. So many of us, when we do care management, in the whole care management industry, have been riding regression to the mean. What we do actually doesn't work when it's tested in rigorous randomized controlled trials. So this does work. Your homeless patients tend to be folks that don't regress to the mean. They tend to be very persistent in their utilization. So this data, we've seen a 50% drop in their utilization. This is real data, it's significant data. And this is the business imperative. This is why United Healthcare hired like a grumpy family doctor from Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> and it's why you've arrived. It's why your movement is now gonna move from the edges of healthcare to being a strategic business imperative for very large companies and very large organizations. Hospitals are gonna talk, talk to you and try and figure out what you're doing and how you can keep uh, some of their patients out. So I wanted to go through some of the solutions that we put together in Camden, and I'm gonna tell you that all these didn't work, 
I'm going to tell you all the things that didn't work. So our first model was really about engagement, navigation, coordination, and accompaniment. And we were just accompanying people to bad service. They were getting yelled at, they were being treated meanly at the front desk, they were getting inappropriate testing. So it's necessary, but insufficient. So this is important for us to do, but care management, care coordination is like a conveyor belt. And if it's just getting you to more bad services and more incorrect diagnoses, then it doesn't matter, it's not working. The next step was how to um, actually accelerate that and make it work better, which was data analysis, we built a health information exchange, coalition building, payment and reform, we wrote a law to create a Medicaid ACO model for New Jersey, and community engagement. Uh, we have a community advisory committee, much like your organization does as well. These are all necessary but insufficient. They accelerated our ability to do high quality care coordination, but they didn't fix the problem of when our patients arrived, they weren't getting the right treatment. We began to engage with primary care pretty deeply. Um, we developed a public campaign called Seven Day Pledge to get providers' offices to get patients back in within seven days. Uh, we began to push lists of data out to all the primary care offices every day of who was admitted and who was discharged. Uh, we began to give incentives to the office, $150 for every patient that gets in within seven days. Uh, the patients get incentives as well. They get a CVS gift card and a cab voucher uh, and, and the daily feeds to the offices. Once again, if you're not getting the correct care, if you're getting a 10, 15 minute primary care visit in a disorganized and chaotic primary care office, it's not helping you. It's not gonna change things. The fourth layer of solutions were retraining my staff. My staff were burning out. They didn't really know how to do this work. And we, we changed from a medical intervention to a behavioral health intervention. So training our staff in harm reduction, motivational interviewing, a kind of backwards planning. I hired the most amazing, beautiful people who ran around rescuing people all day long and not empowering them and enabling them. Uh, training our staff in trauma-informed care, and I hired a PhD psychologist to actually follow the staff around and model for them and train them, uh, up-train them. And then the fifth layer was really how do we hold the organization together? Core values, strategic planning, dashboards, quality improvement cycles, staff training, modern business best practice. I want you guys to think a lot about these things. For your revolution to become an evolution, for you to be able to sell at the scale the services that entities like United are going to need, you're going to have to go from you know, the revolutionaries at the edge of the system to being uh, a going concern and to using business best practice to do more good, better, more efficiently, and more effectively. And that means um, often modernizing, merging, consolidating, growing your organization in new ways that will make your folks uncomfortable. There are folks that came in to create a revolution and as the organization grows, they may get very uncomfortable. So I believe the next wave of your work is going to be thinking about the sort of how does business best practice make you the most efficient, effective organizations that can deliver these services at scale? Are you ready to end homelessness? it could break your organization. Sometimes success can bring you to your knees. So this is what we saw in our data. We see a process of extreme responders, of folks who just stop going to the hospital, they actually re-engage with friends, family, we change their life. It's only if we got everything perfect. And if you don't get all the stuff right, they just keep going to the hospital. So this actually, at a data level, looks a lot like cancer treatment. Lung cancer is a hundred different diseases, and you've got to get a very specific treatment for a very specific subtype, and then they respond. So we have a lot to learn about the tapestry, the heterogeneity of what drives people to utilize the hospital. We think this is about complexity. This is about sort of four buckets of complexity, medical, addiction, mental health, and social complexity, and sort of the being polymorbid across multiple um, domains. This is why you guys are so special, because you actually are good at crossing all four of these in some of your organizations. That's a very unique skill set. Most organizations have not figured that out. Our response to all this complexity on the medical side is the 15-minute visit, lots of incorrect diagnoses. Um, electronic health records and HIEs are speeding our ability to label you and give you an incorrect diagnosis, and then every single incorrect diagnosis follows you around everywhere. 
It's an amazing technical feat. <laughs> On the addiction side, as you all know, it's very still in patient focused, it's sobriety and 12 step focused, it's not harm reduction, it's not uh, comfortable with mental health. There's old school, new school, right? We've got old school medical model, and new school medical model, it's evolving. Old school addiction services, new school. Mental health, um, lots of incorrect diagnoses. We have a paper that's gonna come out where we um, sat with 150 complex high cost patients and got correct diagnoses, really high rate of incorrect diagnoses, um, which results in incorrect meds. Uh, mental health side is very medication, you know, your 15 minute med check. Um, they often put newbies who just got out of, out of school as counselors out on the front line for the hardest and most complex patients. Uh, very hierarchical and disability focused. On the social service side, complicated, not evidence-based often, non-existent, inaccessible, long wait lines. That's a pretty big problem. That's not a care coordination problem, right? That's not just coordinating people between these services. That's actually an obsolescence problem, right? Homeless shelters are obs obsolete. They actually need to be closed, right? So we have a big problem where our entire complex of services on the medical addiction, mental health, and social service side are all obsolete. We actually have a different problem right now, which is an entire modernization and rethinking of how these services work. And Housing First is the best example of the blend of these things and an evidence-based approach targeting a specific population resulting in impactful outcomes. So, you know, the population health folks are like floating off in space over here, like over like connecting IT systems and figuring out algorithms. Housing First is one of the best population health models I've seen. Ryan White clinics are an incredible mo population focused model pulling all these services together for a targeted group. So you guys are sitting on the most important innovations uh, that our societies have come up with in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So um, I want to do just a last plug. My organization's put together a National Center for Complex Health and Social Needs, Ken Coalition. Um, we are holding a second conference in California. We think that there's a specialty in complexity of how all of these different things blend together. And I think that you guys are actually on the cutting edge of this and need to come and tell us how we're going to do this for other subpopulations as well. That we need to figure out a, a field that blends the medical, the behavioral, the social services and the right cocktail for the right person in the right day. So let me stop there. Thank you very much for the chance to be Let's give Dr. Brenner another one. I have many notes from what he said, but what I like most is we are Netflix. We are business disruptors for hospitals and prisons. And uh, we can succeed in that. Um, we will have succeeded in our mission.